So Johanna, what are your thoughts about our wedding last year? It definitely wasn't anything that I could have ever imagined and I'm not saying that in a positive way really. It was the most casual day ever. I basically flew to Vishakapatnam one day before our wedding and then on the like previous night when I was asking uh, asking you, asking Vinod, so what are you going to wear uh, to the court? Uh, for our wedding basically, he's just like uh, the same thing that I'm wearing right now like straight pants, just like a very casual shirt and I'm like, what? It's like supposed to be the most special day of our lives and I have like three white dresses that I bought in Finland specifically for this event and <laughs> you're saying that like, no you are not wearing that we are going shopping now if I'm wearing something according to Finnish traditions, you're wearing Indian clothes. <laughs> and then I forced Vinod that yeah, we're gonna go shopping to Fab India and get him a kurta. It was a very, very casual day. Like, absolutely nothing cultural about it. <laughs> Just bureaucracy. <laughs> So we're on our way to the local magistrate in Shukapatnam and you guessed it right, it's the wedding day. So it's not that big of a deal since it's just like signing a few papers and waiting for the wheels of Indian bureaucracy to start working. There's no running away now. <laughs> Probably like most girls in the world, I have dreamt about my wedding day ever since I was a little girl. My ideas and dreams might have changed during the years, but I always had very specific opinion about what I wanted from my wedding day. But of course, when I met Vinod, who is an Indian citizen, I knew that I would have to make some compromises at least about the wedding that we would have someday. We just wanted to have like a very, very small celebration with our families and uh, our closest friends on top of the legal proceedings. But it did not end up going this way. At least we did get married in the end and now we are here in this extremely beautiful place celebrating our one year wedding anniversary and even though we are happily married now, expecting our first child, I'm still not sure if getting married in India was actually worth it and I would not recommend other uh, Indian foreign couples doing their marriage proceedings in India necessarily unless you are prepared for some really really tough bureaucratic work, lots of papers and documents and all these like legal battles. Which is why I wanted to make this vlog where I'm concentrating on telling you guys how to marry a foreigner in India. So let's get to it. Step one. Get a foreign girlfriend or a boyfriend. Okay, let's assume that you have this already covered and you have fought with your parents and basically now you are ready to get married. Step two, how to actually get ahead with the marriage procedures in India if you are an international couple. Basically, the marriage laws in India are based on your religion, so they completely favor uh, couples who are both Hindu or Muslim or whatever religion they have here in India. But then there is something called Special Marriage Act from 1955 which allows interreligious, intercaste, international marriages to happen. So basically we had two options. Either I would have to convert to Hinduism since I myself am an atheist or then we go ahead with the Special Marriage Act, which was our first option. Step 3. The Special Marriage Act. You are eligible for a Special Marriage Act with a few certain conditions. Neither one of the couple is allowed to have a living spouse. Both of them have to be of sound mind and able to give consent to the marriage and then 
if you meet these requirements, there is also something that an international couple has to meet, which is that both of the partners have to have residency in India for 30 days. And because obviously, before any kind of marriage or for example, if the foreign partner does not have a work in India, they would be here on a tourist visa, which puts quite a tight deadline with this. As soon as I got back to India from Finland, I headed straight to Jaipur to my in-laws house so that I can start my 30 days residency there. Because then after that, you get to apply for the Special Marriage Act and once those proceedings are done, there is a 30-day notice period and then you have to, in the remaining days, arrange for your wedding because on a tourist visa you can only stay 90 days continuously in India before you have to do a visit abroad. Talk about complicated and tight schedule, right? Which then brings us to step four. If after meeting all this criteria you see that, okay, we can go ahead with the application, the application itself is even more difficult. So we decided to go ahead with the Special Marriage Act in Jaipur because we wanted to get married in the presence of Vinod's family. And then we started filling the application. The application itself is like pretty easy to fill. It asks a few specific questions about meeting the conditions and so on. But then we come to the favorite part of Indian bureaucracy, which is lots of attachments because you need to have done tons of different documents to go ahead with the application and with international couples that means that the foreign national has to also have lots of documents from from his or her native country and i also had to acquire a marital status certificate from uh, the Finnish magistrate, which in my case meant that I have to have a single status affidavit, but for some other people this might mean a divorce degree or a certificate of death for a former spouse. Then in India you also need address proof, which usually is gas bill or something like that, and I find this a little bit funny because I've never had to uh, provide similar certificates or proof in Finland. Indian bureaucrats are crazy about their passport size photos, so you always need like a hundred of them and we did also attach those to our application. Then the foreign national also needs some kind of documentary evidence of their 30-day residency in India, which at least in my case was the Form C that my host, as in my father-in-law in Jaipur, had to fill and provide in the local FRRO. And also when we were uh, leaving the application in Jaipur, they were also requesting my criminal record, which shouldn't be something that they need for uh, the Special Marriage Act. And anyways, already when I'm applying for the tourist visa, I have to give the information if there is any kind of criminal record. So I'm just like still confused about this and it wasn't anything that was actually necessary for us to go ahead with the marriage. But then the biggest issue in the application is that the uh, Jaipur marriage office was requiring a proof of Vinod's domicile. And this is something that just doesn't make any sense at all to either one of us, that why would a uh, special marriage act require an Indian citizen to provide proof of their domicile, because as an Indian citizen, shouldn't they be free to move throughout the country, live anywhere, work anywhere, and get married in any region that they please? And especially in my husband's case, he doesn't have a domicile, he has never stayed in one place in India for more than five years, so he just like simply does not have a domicile. and would not be able to get this for the Special Marriage Act, but even in these conditions, the marriage officer in Jaipur was just like absolutely adamant that no, he has to have a domicile. So we were not able to get approval for the Special Marriage Act in Jaipur. So 
that left us just with one option to get married in Jaipur, which would be that I would convert to Hinduism. And I was open for that option actually. But in Rajasthan, even conversion for marriage is a huge issue and the judge would not have approved the marriage there if I had converted to Hinduism. So, yep. Oh my god, we're not able to get married there. What next? So our lawyer suggested that the next step would be that he knows this guy in Delhi who can help us uh, in arranging the conversion there and then we could just like next day walk into the closest Arya Samaj and by the way Arya Samaj is the first Hindu organization in India that uh, approved the act of conversion to Hinduism. So it would have been possible there, but at this point it was like, oh my god, this is getting way too complicated. Like, neither one of us has any kind of connection to Delhi, and this seems like, oh my god, it has to be like some kind of plot, because these are rights that are guaranteed to us in the Indian law, so we felt like we would have to end up paying a lot of money in bribes or something. So no, we are not going to do that and in the end Vinod also put his foot down that he just absolutely does not want me to convert to Hinduism just for the sake of us getting married. Vinod had to, at this point, return to Vishakapatnam, where he was still working at this point uh, for his last few weeks, because in addition to being in the middle of a marriage process, we were also in the middle of a relocation process to Kerala, and we wanted to get the marriage done uh, before we were in Kerala so that we would be able to start our official life together there. What to do, what to do. So Vinod also con contacted a lawyer in Vishakapatnam to see if it would be able to get the Special Marriage Act application done there. And thank goodness for the good South Indian rational mind and flexibility and understanding of uh, foreign nationalities, we had an amazing lawyer in Vishakapatnam and he just like handled everything so smoothly. Initially, for example, there was a little bit of confusion if I also had to be present in Vishakapatnam at the time of the application, but the lawyer completely handled it all and I was able to stay in Jaipur and avoid one additional flight trip to Vishakapatnam. So, in the end, I only traveled to Vishakapatnam one day before our court marriage and then after uh, going to the court uh, last October I just flew back to Jaipur to my in-laws. And handling the final uh, paperwork and bureaucracy in the in the court in Vishakapatnam, it was very, very easy. We just had to go there, wait for our turn, and then uh, the clerk there had, or the marriage officer there, had all the documents ready, and uh, both of us had to sign these, and then we had three of our friends there as witnesses who also signed the papers. Then, uh, at least according to my research online, we were supposed to say to each other that uh, I so and so take you so and so as my legal spouse or something like this. But now that I think about it, we did not say, to th say this to each other, so does this mean that we're not a valid married couple? Anyways, all the documents are signed and stamped and in a marriage book somewhere, so I'm pretty sure that we are married legally. And of course, in the end, it was like a happy event, happy ending, but having gone through all these hassles and work meant for us that we didn't even want to have the small marriage celebration that we had considered earlier. We haven't even celebrated it together with Vinod's parents and his sister. Who knows if we'll do it someday, but that's not in the plans right now. Which brings me to the last topic, which is that there is so much to improve in the 
uh, special marriage act procedures here in India because it is definitely not equal to the religion-based marriage laws and does not offer any kind of convenience and ease to international couples getting married here in India. If for some luck we had both been Hindu with Vinod, we wouldn't have had to fill any kind of papers to notify the government about our intent to marry or even any kind of like religious boards. We could have just like walked to a temple, done our fera, get married and be done with it. Through the Special Marriage Act, there are just way too many documents that are required in the application and it could be simplified a lot, especially as India is moving towards a digital age where they should have a digital database of all this information and especially the 30-day notice period after the couple leaves their application to the marriage officer who is then legally required to uh, put all these details into a very visible notice board at the registrant. Firstly, so many personal details of the couple are made public in this notice, for example their names, days of births, parents' details, their addresses, home numbers, so all this kind of personal information is just readable there for everyone to see. And then this obviously poses a threat because there are some more extreme conservative uh, groups that would object to interreligious, intercaste or international marriages. And there have been many instances throughout India where these extremist groups target those couples and even the families that uh, often in more traditional areas would object to these kinds of marriages and for example in Haryana the uh, marriage offices have sent these notices to the home addresses of the couple and even posted on national newspapers with all these details which is a huge threat to their safety so I think that the Special Marriage Act should be something that is as easy as the religious-based marriage laws. But I hope that for all those interreligious international couples, uh, especially foreign nationals, that <laughs> this uh, video doesn't scare you too much, but I just wanted to give you uh, a very realistic depiction of our experience with getting married here. and. Of course, I'm very, very happy that we did it, but you just really should be prepared for all these kinds of struggles because I certainly have to admit that I was not prepared at all. All my research online did not give me a big picture of how difficult it could be. If you have any kinds of questions, please do ask in the comments because I will be so happy to share all, all my knowledge and experience of the uh, procedure of getting married in India. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys very soon. Mwah. I'm off to celebrate our anniversary more now.